we often talk about body dysphoria. And the other thing you really think about is this concept of muscle dysphoria, which is the root for a lot of patients who are using performance enhancing drugs, is really focused on the fact that this obsession that their body should be more lean and more muscular, that you're devoting significant amount of time to weightlifting and fixation on one's diet. It's estimated like up to 3 million people are current performance enhancing drug users. And if you compare this with some other chronic diseases, it's more than the HIV and the type 1 diabetes prevalence. But we talk more about that than we do performance enhancing drugs. That's a lot of people. And when we think about how much that impacts just our community in general, it's something that we should really think about. We should really start asking ourselves, why are we doing this? Hi everyone, my name is Steven Wakabayashi and you're listening to Yellow Glitter, Mindfulness Through the Eyes and Soul of Queer Asian Perspectives. This episode, we're joined by our lovely guest, JT Jonathan Tolentino, once again. JT is a program director of the Combined Internal Medicine Pediatrics Residency Program at Jackson Memorial Hospital, University of Miami and Associate Professor of Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at University of Miami. He works with BIPOC and LGBTQ plus communities, as well as uninsured and underserved populations. We had a beautiful conversation last time just about COVID and managing our own mental health during it, and thought to bring JT back to talk a little bit more on our bodies and different perspectives about our bodies moving into this new year. So welcome back, JT. Thank you, Stephen. It's an absolute pleasure to be back on the podcast. So just want to start the first part of the conversation with a quick check-in, JT. How are you doing at this time? I think since the last time we spoke, it's been an interesting time. We've gone from a time when COVID looked like it was finally decently well controlled and then Omicron came up and I can tell you this has been a very different COVID surge and I think that's the part that's been really tough. I think the best way to put it is that I'm managing. I think we're all managing from this point. One of the things that's been very difficult I guess from a COVID standpoint was that A, it happened over Christmas and New Year's and so that kind of put a huge damper on many people's plans, including my own. And then what's very unique about this particular variant is how contagious it is. And we've been dealing with lots of physicians, nursing staff, and what have you out. And so we're running on much leaner staffing in the hospitals and the clinics. And I think we're all feeling the stressors. And so I think the big thing that I can't emphasize more to everybody is to get vaccinated, to wear your mask, being down here in Florida. It's been an interesting Uh, turn of events, especially when it comes to masking and especially when it comes to the vaccines and how the surge has played out. But it's been definitely a challenge. Yes, I bet. I just can't say it enough. I am so grateful for healthcare practitioners like yourself and so many others still vigilantly working through all of this. And it just seems like whenever we get to a point when we think Things are much better. We think things have normalized. We are starting to travel again and having people over that uh, new variant just seems to repeat itself as a part of this cyclical pandemic. And I just read recently in the news that France also had discovered a new variant as well. And so I'm just curious, where do you think we're going to go in the next few months, at least immediately for 2022. So uh, what's interesting about the French variant is that one's been around for a little bit, hasn't really caught on as a major variant that seems to be causing a huge upsurge, at least in, in the part of France in which that's in. But I think the reality that we're going to see is that as COVID continues to develop more of these variants, we're going to see some of them will pop up, some of them won't. And I think really understanding that the public health measures that are out there, whether it's distancing, whether it's masking, what have you, the more we do that and the more that we prevent COVID from being able to actually mutate as much, we'll be better off. I'm always very grateful for when people are, think as healthcare workers and think as a staff and doing that, but I'm actually even more grateful 
for those who continue to still keep up with the same public health measures that we ascribed to at the very beginning of the pandemic. It's so disheartening when you go out. I live here in South Beach and you see everybody at the clubs and at the parties and at dinners and what have you and not doing any of the measures that you need to protect yourself and protect others. And everybody keeps saying, we just have to live with it. But the thing I fear the most is a variant like Omicron that's very contagious and a variant like Delta that was fairly virulent. And those are the two factors that we as physicians worry about actually coming together um, to create a really terrible pandemic or a really terrible surge. We hope you'll get to that. And I think that's where you have all of our public health experts all agree that the way to get there is through vaccines and making sure that we're all vaccinated. We're very fortunate here in the United States and most Western countries that we're able to actually get vaccinated. We're actually able to get the boosters. And we know there's great inequities in around the world. The WHO really pointed this out that of the way that we are able to overcome this particular COVID surge and just COVID in general is if we can get vaccines to even the most marginalized countries. So it, it's a huge effort. We've done a great job here in the United States, but it's unequal and it's still not where it needs to be. So anybody who's listening, please get vaccinated. Please wear your mask. Please don't go to white parties. Please don't do any of that right now. Just hold on for a little bit. I promise. We'll get there. Oh, yes. And the topic for our podcast today, I think is especially really relevant in the new year, is on body image. And especially as we start the new year, a lot of people often sign up for new gym memberships, new yoga studio memberships. Now, this year, mindfulness <laughs> memberships and trying to lead the year strong with a lot of ways that we can shift and improve our bodies and minds. And also with that, one thing that has come up again and again in conversations like ours and many other conversations is really about this concept of body and body image as it pertains to the queer community. And one of the things that comes up time and time again are this hypercriticism of our bodies that we hold of our own. And oftentimes it leads us to many different types of behaviors, which we'll go into in our conversation later today. But I just want to start with a question for you, which is, frankly speaking, why is our community so obsessed with body and body image? When we look at the ideal image. I think a lot of this has developed over many decades, especially with what we consider an ideal man, right? And a lot of this comes from internalized homophobia. A lot of this comes up through how some of the sexual minority development in just the general community have really bestowed itself on what does it mean to be gay? What does it mean to be bi? What does it mean to all this? And unfortunately, there's this constant conundrum of our self-love and who we are as a community, but then this hyper idealization of what does it mean to be a real man and what does it mean to be a real gay man? And I think with this hyper masculinity that exists just in general, still in many of our communities, whether you're straight, bi, or what have you, it really starts pushing the envelope, especially within the gay community. And a lot of that is still rooted in the discrimination from the sexual majority. A lot of the self hate room that really starts when we're children and we're younger and we begin to understand our own sexual identities and trying to push against what this idealized man is. And unfortunately, it's really come through. And the other hard part is that within um, the gay community, your physical appearance becomes your identity. And especially with that and a lot of the internalized homophobia that unfortunately manifests, I think, in itself with how we perceive ourselves externally and this hyper-masculization that we can both be a man and we can be gay creates this tension within us. And I think it, it, it creates a very unhealthy image of who we are and what does it mean to be a healthy person. And this is where we see ourselves right now. And a lot of us have been using social media, especially during the pandemic. And I think we really saw this come through with the way that we connected with the outside world has mostly been electronic, especially in the past two years. We have Instagram, we have things like TikTok and all of those that almost give us permission to continue to look at others through this lens or through this other image. Yeah. And the rise of using filters. For the longest time, people on Instagram, right, always edited images, using Facetune and all these different applications to modify. And now in real time, we can just have a filter applied. 
and it completely changes the complexity of our skin, the color of our skin. Some filters even just simply lighten our skin color, skin tone. And what was interesting, I don't know if it was a conversation that we had, but a lot of plastic surgeons have been getting requests to make them look like a particular filter now versus the images that people were bringing in of different celebrities, right? Now they're like, make me look like this particular filter. And when we use social media platforms and look at videos and look at images, I think the hard part is discerning what is real from what is modified. And uh, oftentimes the truth, the reality is not put in front of us. Influencers don't put everything that they've modified, edited within the descriptions and the bios. And there is this pressure for influencers also to normalize, right? Oh, this is just how I look like every single day. And imagine the toll that takes on all of us. We're now this hyper-realized world where everyone is so beautiful. Everyone is so gorgeous. Nobody has a single pimple. And I think it really messes with us, with our mind, as far as determining even just what is the baseline. I I think that this is the part where we see these images and we look at ourselves and what we look at is unfiltered because we don't know what's filtered or not filtered. And we almost want to believe that it's true, but it's hard to believe because We know that digital manipulation is so easy to do. And what does no filter mean? Because rarely do you put the worst picture possible on Instagram. You filter everything. Everybody is always talking about putting the best foot forward. And how you manipulate that best foot forward is distorts reality on a day basis, right? Like even today, nobody can see exactly what I look like or what I'm wearing and what have you. And I think that part makes it so difficult for us, but because we see best images, then we start projecting ourselves into what is that? Is that what my best image should look like? Should I be looking like this at all? And those questions, even if it isn't a clinical diagnosis of obsession or what have you, does create this really unhealthy image of ourselves. And especially if we are dealing with our own anxieties and we are dealing with our own feeling of shortcomings, it can lead to problems where you're doing either unhealthy things to yourselves or you have a negative mental picture of yourselves, which can deepen or actually bring upon depression and anxiety and all the many things that we know we are in the middle grips of and COVID doesn't make it any better. Absolutely. And going back to the point you mentioned earlier around where that sits within the context of the gay community, I had talked about this in a previous podcast too, where oftentimes we lean on our bodies as a way to try to escape injustices, escape intolerance. And it is a never ending trap. (laughs) And it is a facade in which if we modify our bodies, somehow we can escape the injustices or intolerance that have been laid before us because we're playing in the context of homophobia. We're playing in the context of the patriarchy, we're playing the context of all these different systems, racism, that regardless of what we do now, we sometimes get this little carrot that's dangled in front of us where people are like, oh, commenting on our bodies. Oh my God, you're so beautiful. And there's also this stereotype, right? That gay men especially are more beautiful than the average man. But in reality, that isn't necessarily a truth. It's just gay men are more hypercritical could be and but at the same time being gay is also not a monolith and we don't all look the same way and so i think as a part of it what i've realized was this dismantling of this hypercriticism that i have of myself is also really beneficial for me to open up my perspective of the myriad of experiences and the way that gay men can exist in life. And myself, I, at one point, worked out seven days a week. I was doing CrossFit, yoga. I was just so obsessed with trying to get my body to look a certain way. And one, the compliments are very addictive, right? You work out and everyone just compliments you all the time. Oh, you look good. You look good. And sometimes I was, you know, going to sleep. And after a few hours waking up, 
to go exercise. The sun wasn't even out and I would do this all the time. And then it just got to a point where my body just gave up and I couldn't do it anymore. But I would say one, the comments were just so addictive to receive, which didn't help fueling the unhealthy habit that I had, not resting. And then the second part was, as I looked at myself in the mirror, I didn't see what I see now looking back at old photos on Instagram or, or just my repository of Google Photos. But every time I looked at myself in the mirror, especially during the peak of my fitness regimen, I, I just saw myself as incomplete. I saw myself as not being this image that I wanted. And I just kept putting all these people with the most ridiculous body goals, but it was not a really healthy relationship that I had with my body. And it didn't take until really ending up in the hospital and just seeing my body wither away because I wasn't able to work out. And over the course of three to four months, I lost so much muscle mass. And then that again also spiraled me down into a very depressive moment where I was like, oh my God, I spent so many years working on this and uh, it's all gone. But, you know, light at the end of the tunnel is just having a better relationship with my body now. I'm just being grateful that I'm still here, still able to move. But I would say, had it not been for that spiral downward, I would not have been in a healthy position still. I would have continued a lot of my unhealthy habits with fitness, ironically, and this concept of body dysmorphia, where we don't see what exactly is here, the body that is here. And it's hard. It, it's just really hard to manage, especially when it's compliments coming at the same time, not having a healthy relationship with this. The question for you is either through your experience or the practice that you have working with patients or other folks in our communities is what I'm saying, just like something that is very common, widespread, and how are people even managing? I would say it's very common, especially that sense of the physical attractiveness or like being able to almost feel that you're in the mold that you want to be in. And there's this always sense that I want to be healthy. Our concepts are healthy is always based upon this physicality. And it's a discussion I have with, with many of my patients. And I, I very much talk about, well, how are you being healthy? What are the things you're doing? Are you using supplements? What kind of supplements? And it's very much involved in my own practice where you are beginning to ask those specific questions. And because we know that there's this real sense of that healthy means physicality, healthy doesn't actually mean all elements of health. And again, a lot of this has to do with this sense of this physical presence that we are all very obsessed with. And fortunately, a lot of this probably likely lies in with the sense of what it means to be of status in the gay community, right? Where the sense of status comes from the this physical nature. And I think that entire stressor that creates really leads to an unhealthy relationship with our body. Uh, what really saddens me is that there are many people who actually have to hit rock bottom or really hurt their bodies before they recognize that health isn't physical health is all elements of the mental it's the internal it's all elements of our relationship with the body and to who we are as people i think that's the part that i really see and i think sometimes what makes it tough is that this sense of status within the community can lead to very different types of relationships with ourselves and with each other where our social relationships are really built upon this sense of physicality in, in some instances and that there is great value put on. You want the Harvard educated guy with nice massive shoulders and a great six pack and great arms and they're an engineer and they're doing all these wonderful things. But underneath all of that, I, I actually see more in the community trying to normalize that they have this underlying anxiety and depression. With some of my older gay patients and our patients in the community, it takes many years before they're finally comfortable in the skin we live in. And I've heard this story multiple times where they're like, yeah, I used to be like that. That was what I worried about, but now I'm not. And I was like, what do you wish you told your 22 year old self? And they're all like, doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you have a good relationship with yourself, your relationship with people that you love, but it's tough because there's so much trauma. And usually for many of us in our twenties and thirties, this is not the conversation we have with ourselves. Our conversation is, 
I don't have the perfect six pack. My chest isn't big enough. My legs aren't big enough. And how can I get to the status? Then I can figure out loving myself and loving others in a healthy way. As a physician, you tell this to your patients, but you know that it's not always landing because for a lot of people, it is a journey, but it's a journey that I wish never had to happen if we could have normalized what normal physical appearance look like as teenagers and, and as adults. Yeah. What also comes to mind for me are the dating apps, the hookup apps, and all of the attributes that you put in a drop down that you could search people by. And it took many years, almost a whole decade, for some of the applications to finally remove the filter by race. Some do still have them. I think they're perpetuating a lot more damage than positive for our communities, but we still have filtering by body type and filtering by all these different attributes that are just around the physique. And what I always talk about with dating apps is we have a healthier dating app when we can emulate what's in the real world, right? And when we filter these things out by either body type, by race, ethnicity, all these things, we start creating this ethereal feed of all these people concentrated in a way that is based off of what we are continuing to perpetuate, which could be social stigmas, internalized homophobia, internalized racism, body dysmorphia. And I think our dating apps have a long way to go with starting to actually do the work of destigmatizing different body types not putting muscular six-pack ripped abs without the face <laughs> in the dead center of the profile and at the same time i think we individually need to do a bit of work into figuring out okay what is driving me to click on this what is driving me to focus on this what is driving me to center this search and this hunt that i have specifically on somebody's washboard abs and one truth that has shaken my identity and made me think critically about a lot of my values was understanding what we are attracted to is not just our attraction, but it's, it says a lot more about ourselves, our values, what we are prioritizing as we talk about what constitutes a healthy relationship with somebody. Bodies come and go. And what I realized was, why are we putting it at such a high point, especially in finding a mate? We understand that somebody either stops working out or works out even harder over the course of a year, it can completely transform. And there are so many other attributes about people, right? The values people hold, how people managing the finances, relationships they have with their friends, their families. Those things are really tough to change or that these should be pillars as to us finding mates. And it's taken me a while to really come to a point when I didn't just observe it, but I actually had to do a lot of work to destigmatize. And as I did truly do the work, I also noticed that my values and my attraction to people completely shifted as well. And the people that I previously would have not found attractive, I'm now finding other values, other attributes about that, that aren't the physique being very attractive qualities to me. These dating apps, I think, have a long way to go. And I think they, unfortunately, at the moment, end up perpetuating so much of this stuff that we're talking about as well. Yeah. It's interesting because you, you think about the dating apps and it's almost like we use the pictures as the way into each other. When you look at somebody and say, I'm attracted to them and that's the initial. I think what we will lose from all of that is the real reason that we are looking for relationships is actually having that connection and connections beyond pictures. If I was connected with pictures, then I would just have pictures all around my house all day looking at pretty men and be completely satisfied. When I think about how do you make dating apps, how do you make this so that we're not focused on the physicality is I think a tall order for many of us because we have been so focused for many years, how we connect with people on what pictures look like. And, and I, I think the entire sense of how do you actually put yourself out there? How do you do that in a healthy way is something that takes time. And that really innovative thought of 
how do people actually naturally come together and have connections? Think about it before dating apps and what have you. Many of us, our first relationships were in college and it had nothing to do with the fact that one another looked beautiful. Maybe it did, but long-term relationships before dating apps really came about because you had shared experiences, you had shared conversations, and that's really where it comes from. It's not a, hi, what you doing? Not much. You want to do it? Those are deep conversations that I understand from the standpoint from a dating app is that it's leveled to some extent the playing field that anybody could potentially be a date for anyone anywhere in the world. But I think you're right. We do have a lot to go through and to really think about in order to keep up that physique, it takes a lot of time and effort. And that once that time and effort goes away, physicality and everything we do to our bodies, it's all fleeting. But the hard part is that what you do to your bodies. And what you do unintentionally to your bodies may not be fleeting. And that's the part that we just don't appreciate because physicality is such an in the moment type of situation. Nobody goes to the gym and says, this weight I'm lifting right now in 45 years will promise me this. It'll promise me happiness. It does it. And I think that's the part that we just don't appreciate enough. And I think this is something that we as a community have to really come to grips with. And I think all of us are guilty when it comes to saying, I don't want to think of the physicality, but we know that's still a component to some extent. The question is what that relationship to the physicality, what does that actually really mean? Absolutely. The work is very similar to the work of anti-racism work, right? Where the first step is acknowledging that we live in the context of a society that privileges people based on how they look how they appear, the physicality, the superficiality of it. And inherently, because we exist in this society, we have attributes of being superficial, playing a role in upholding pretty privilege. And the first step is acknowledging. And then the second step is then working through it. Unless we have actually done the work to shift ourselves away from the system, we have yet to do the work. And going back to what you said, we do so many things with our bodies, not realizing the impact that it has. And the next part of our conversation is touching a little bit about substance abuse and substance use as a part of getting the perfect Adonis body. And a little bit background of myself for the listeners who haven't heard it before, but I've been a part of many different gay, queer community is one of it being the circuit party community. And I have many friends in the space. And over the years, one trend that I've noticed time and time again, and it's accelerated over the years, is the use of steroid, growth hormones, testosterone use, beyond the conventional medical use, but just simply for aesthetics, simply for body uh, modifications. And it has become much more common than it has over the past decade. And it is so prevalent that it's becoming this common thing, especially within some of my friend groups where people are just sharing tips and tricks on how to use some of these substances in the most effective way possible. And unfortunately, there has also been detriments to some bodies around me and what I'm noticing too is just some of the lasting effects that it has had on some of the bodies of my friends, how it's impacted not just the muscle growth, while somebody may look beautiful on the outside, internally I'm suffering with a lot of different after effects. And so I just want to ask you, JT, what are you seeing from a physician's point of view, especially with substance use? as it pertains to the body and what do we do about it? It is a big problem. I do have to really think about addressing it in a systematic manner. You know, I always start with thinking about performance enhancing drugs. Um, how do we change our bodies and how do we do this? And I, I do want to make a point that this is different than those who find exercise, working out and really thinking about the physique in a healthy manner, very different than those who are using it for the purpose of some other underlying motivation. and. We often talk about body dysphoria, and the other thing you really think about is this concept of muscle dysphoria. Body dysphoria is really focused on that imagined defect in appearance, right? Like I'm too fat, I'm too skinny, or what have you. But 
and muscle dysphoria, which is the root for a lot of patients who are using performance enhancing drugs, is really focused on the fact that this obsession that their body should be more lean and more muscular, that you're devoting significant amount of time to weightlifting and fixation on one's diet, which can lead to use of performance enhancing drugs of some sort. And if you look at the numbers, it's actually fairly significant. It's estimated like up to 3 million people are current performance enhancing drug users. And if you compare this with some other chronic diseases, it's more than the HIV and the type 1 diabetes prevalence. But we talk more about that than we do performance enhancing drug. And so it's almost at a point where we should be screening for this. We should really be talking about this. There's been multiple studies looking at this where if you start using it as an adolescent, you're more likely to use it as an adult. And in one study, up to 30% of people in the study who identified as gay use a performance um, enhancing drugs in some capacity in the past year. Lifetime prevalence has been anywhere between 10 to 18%. That's a lot of people. And when we think about how much that impacts just our community in general, it's something that we should really think about. We should really start asking ourselves, why are we doing this? As we talk about these numbers, I think what the hardest part is that many of us don't see this as a medical problem. In the end, what we're thinking about is product or outcome, right? We're not thinking the process. So the process to get here leads to this amazing body with these huge muscles and that you can go to these parties and take off your shirt and you can show all this amazing physique that everybody else has. And there's a sense of community, right? And so everybody's doing it. Everybody's with each other. And you mentioned your own experiences in the circuit community, which is very prevalent and is perpetuating. And unfortunately, this leads to this normalization of this potentially very unhealthy behavior. And when we see this happening, or when we look at the studies, it's around the 22 to 24 year mark, which is that time right after college, when you're finally on your own and it's like your peak um, physically, that's when we see a lot of our patients actually using these medications and using these drugs in very unhealthy ways. When we think about like even side effects, so when I use medications like testosterone or what have you for hypogonadism, which is a condition where you're just not producing enough testosterone for various different reasons, or we're using it for patients who have had testicular cancers and they, we've had to radiate their testicles, for, which can cause low testosterone levels. We're using lower doses, like 150, 300 milligrams or titrating it based upon where testosterone levels are. Most patients who are using a lot of these performance enhancing drugs are using like 500 to 1,000 more milligrams per week. That's just way too much. And we talk about our bodies being our temples, but they're very fine-tuned temples. They're not just temples that are like, oh, no, we need more. It, it doesn't work that way because our bodies are expecting a certain balance. And when it doesn't get that balance, it goes into these hyperdrives on something and turns down other things. And it can lead to a lot of medical consequences that unfortunately many are not aware of or assume that they have control over it and then they'll just leave it to deal with later on. I always equate the body to a car. And oftentimes when the car breaks down, there were so many things that had gone wrong with it already to the point when it's not igniting the engine or starting. And oftentimes we fail to realize that our body is naturally trying to adapt, naturally trying to heal, naturally trying to fix itself. The kind of caveat to that is we can keep funneling stuff into our body, doing stuff to our body and not realizing or seeing the immediate impact of it because our body is trying to regulate itself. And so what we may see what is happening in terms of regulation may actually be not allowing us to see the immediate detrimental effects that's happening to our bodies. And especially with the use of these performance enhancement substances, sometimes we don't see until it is way too late. And in many of <laughs> the spaces of my friend's group, the first sign is always, yeah, I'm just going to do one cycle, one cycle, and I'm just going to just boost my workout regimen a little bit. It's just like a pre-workout. And I think what is so intoxicating and dangerous is the effect that it has immediately on the body. You work out the same amount, but you're seeing the impact 10x, 100x of what it is. 
And what ends up happening that I see too often as well is people getting off of it and saying, okay, the cycle is finished. So let me get off of it. And as soon as they get off of it, because they hadn't set up a healthy, sustainable workout regimen for themselves, their body begins to adapt in the way that it was adapting previously. And in that adaptation, some people gain tremendous amount of weight, or some people have muscular dystrophy, or the muscles completely start to dissipate. And because the change is so drastic and dramatic for some people, that is oftentimes where I see people getting back on it immediately. And then just saying something like, yeah, let me go on a low dose, but not get off of it in these cycles that typically help people take the dosage. I see this way too often, and it's always the same story over and over again, at least what I hear of, this one cycle that people want to get on, and then being stuck perpetually because of just the impact that it has. But unfortunately, when we are so focused right on the outside, not looking what's happening on the inside, or thinking about what is a sustainable practice, right? Because ultimately we start taking this, this is not a sustainable practice over 20, 40, 50 years, not at all. And so it's just without having the end in mind or just thinking about what is a sustainable practice for ourselves, it damages our body sometimes in unforeseeable ways. And then we don't see it until it's too late. And unfortunately for myself, I've seen friends come and go over the years, and they're all pretty young too, in their 30s. And it's very unfortunate to even think or consider that these could have played a role in some of that as well. It's definitely something that I hope that our communities can talk a bit more about, not just in a way that we perpetuate it. We're saying, oh my God, you look amazing. Your body looks great. It's just talking a little bit about that too. One thing that I've modified in the way I talk to people is I've actually stopped using compliments on people's bodies without understanding habits, or I will compliment the habits that go into producing desired set outcome. And so if I understand somebody wanted to hit the gym and wanted to make it a daily practice, and if that's the activity that they're doing, and I know that's what they wanted to do to make a sustainable practice, that is what I will compliment and uphold. And I'm trying to do my best of removing all of these compliments that fit within the superficial context. And sometimes I think it's something that we don't really think about. And we immediately will compliment. You look leaner today. You look bigger today. Or for some people who want to look leaner or thinner. Some people will say, oh, did you lose weight in a good way? And I once had this girlfriend who she got really sick, really sick, couldn't digest food over the course of a few months and lost a ton of weight. And when we were talking once, she had confided in me that she said, what was the hardest was to hear the compliments coming from people, even though I had gone through this debilitating condition that made me lose so much weight. Everyone complimenting how much weight I had lost and how good I looked, even though my body had just been wrecked. And so it's interesting to have this dichotomy, right? Where it's what isn't necessarily what you get. And in complimenting just what we see, sometimes we might be perpetuating more damage than good. Yeah, because it all kinds of stems from body shaming. And I like that entire concept of being able to actually really talk about healthy habits as opposed to perceived image. And, it, you know, really focused on you're doing an amazing job at being healthy as opposed to you're doing an amazing job, however you're doing it, and having big muscles and, and washboard abs. So it is this sense of that body dysmorphia or actually feeding into the, the muscle dysphoria that occurs that actually is a huge motivator to come off of a cycle and to see that the steroid effect is a very temporizing effect. And that it's funny that we don't get joy out of the process of working out, but that we get this outcome of this overly distorted image of what a normal body should look like, that we honor that more so than saying, hey, you look like a healthy human being and that you did it in a healthy way. And I think that that feeds into it 
The other part that I think is really tough is that your body naturally makes testosterone. But if you give it more than it needs, the body says, all right, you figured out how to give me more testosterone. So I'm going to stop making it. On top of the, so the muscle dysphoria, the body stops making testosterone and leads to fatigue, the loss of libido, the depression. While there are ways in which people have been, uh, been able to actually avoid that through other medications. And again, redosing with more things just to fix another thing that you've messed up, it, it creates this really negative feeling. And that creates the desire to want to actually go back on the medication again. And it just perpetuates this and perpetuates and perpetuates. The thing to remember is that the suppression of the testosterone, if you do it enough and do it too much for too long, the body just gives up and says, not going to do it anymore. And then you're stuck in this hypogonadic state and you've lost a libido, you're depressed and it just worsens. And that's why we find that up to a third of patients who start using forms of enhancing drugs and being addicted to it because the cycle just perpetuates. You're absolutely right. I love that you're taking it from the standpoint of encouraging the positive body image because what's partly going to help actually normalize it, right? If you normalize good behaviors and healthy ways of actually managing your body and the way you manage your own self-image and projected self-image for somebody else, it's going to be such an important part of how we almost prevent this from happening into the future. Unfortunately, even though I have seen some popular media begin to talk about this more, it just hasn't caught on. And I think a lot of that comes from, we just keep normalizing it. We keep popularizing as a way to be popular, to be within the community. And it's almost as if you're not that, that we almost taking you outside of the community or that is not part of what the greater, larger community that has normally marginalized the gay community has accepted as what it means to be a gay man or a bi man. And you just keep perpetuating it and perpetuating it. And I think that one is very tough because it's multi-layered, but it does start with one person and it starts with all of us really thinking about how do we normalize healthy behaviors and a normal healthy body type. It's very different. And as a physician, it's about being healthy, being at a healthy weight, everybody should love their body. But I'm also as a physician going to think about what should risk for heart disease in 10, 20, 30 years. I'm still thinking about that. It's about just loving who you are and understanding that exercise, diet, and a healthy body isn't washed for it in That a healthy body is just a body that you take care of and that is done in a way that doesn't actually put you at detrimental health. And the thing that you have to remember, when you get to that 5% body fat, right? There's a biologic reason that we all have fat in our body. It's a way to store long-term energy and to continually deplete those, that, that fuel and to keep it that low, you're, you have to rev up your body in a way that it's not physiologically really set to do on a regular basis. And while obesity is not a great thing, being too low is not a great thing either. Everybody is all set in this very fine balance between being too fat or too skinny. And if you think about it, even animals in the wild, they increase their body fat during the winter times in order to, to store that energy. But we have distorted what it means to store energy, what it means to actually have a healthy body, because we assume that one body type is the perfect body type for everybody. Yeah. Media, like you mentioned, all these adverts play such a big role in normalizing one specific type of body. And we can all do so much better in terms of what we are not just accepting and loving, but what we are amplifying. Who are we following? Where are we spending our time? What are we saying to people with this idealized version of a body? And what are we saying to people who don't have this quote unquote idealized version of the body. And one good practice that has helped me has been, what do I say about my body? And how am I talking about my body to myself? And if I am hypercritical, judgmental, what I always say is what we judge on the outside is really a reflection of what we're judging on the inside. And by really normalizing behaviors that are self-sustaining, that are healthy, truly healthy, and healthy in the sense that we can keep doing this 20, 30, 40 years from now, that will help put us in a much better place to live a long, thriving life. That is really what we should be going after. 
versus the short-term immediate impacts that ultimately detriment our longevity in life. And I'm a math person. I'm trying to do these quantitative assessments of plus, minuses. And I said to myself, what's the point of gaining a few years where I'm like, ah, oh, top of the food chain, and then that cut 20, 30 years of my life down? Is that really worth living? At least for myself, I really struggle to say yes to that. And especially with my health, when it <laughs> declimated all the way down, I faced mortality and this fragility of my life and not knowing if I was going to be able to come out of it. And I don't wish anyone to be in that position. And I love having conversations like this with people like you just to open up the doors to talk about some of these things that are really like some of the stats you said, I didn't realize it was that prevalent. I just thought it was like very prevalent with my social spaces because of different activities people are a part of. But you know, what we also don't talk about too is in the media industry, models, celebrities, TV celebrities, we are not aware of some of the substance abuse that's happening in that space as well. And I have some friends in that space and the amount of times these are pushed to people in a way to modify the bodies so that they can look better in media, look better in shows. It is very alarming. And it's just, I think, this isn't something that we can do individually to fix the whole issue. This is really something that we do together. First, working with ourselves in the way that we talk to ourselves and talk outwardly to ourselves, but also working as a community so that we can help to sustain ourselves. And we've all, as a community, gone through so much, so much pain, heartache, homophobia is still rampant, not just around the United States, but around the world. And at least that's what I say. I'm like, the simplest thing we could do is just talk to each other so much nicer. Like, why are we so hard on each other? Especially as a queer gay community, right? It's interesting because I think it does come down to status. So what does it mean to be the successful queer Asian man? Or what does it mean to have everything or happiness? And it's funny because I think we have pigeonholed it into this one particular stereotype. It's almost like the, the gay renaissance man can do all these things and can be perfectly, have this perfect physique or what have you. The other thing you mentioned that what kind of made me think a little about when you talk about popular media was that before many years, we kept pushing that Asian men are sexy and that Asian men are just as desirable as any other man out there. And the one thing that freaks mine is is that bad or good? Is the Asian man a sex symbol in Hollywood or in popular media? But is that actually healthy in this context? What does that a sexy Asian man look like? Is it this very Western ideal of what a sexy man is? Or are we really defining what a desirable man should be? That's tough because the queer Asian community is not immune to this. There are still all those quote unquote thirst traps on Instagram, not only coming from the United States, but come from all around from Asia, from Europe, what have you of all these Asian men with their shirts off and looking amazing and all those types of things. I embrace the fact that popular media is seeing Asian men as just as desirable as every other man out there. But it's also potentially dangerous because we're not immune to the same pressure as everybody else is. And what I always say is it has to be all Asian men, all Asian people. That's attractive. You, you can't have just a few people that are select that are the lighter skinned ones, right? The taller ones, the more ripped ones. You have to have everyone be a part of it. And when we can't do that is work that we have to do to figure out what it is that we can do mentally, spiritually, that will get us there. And it's funny, you bring up the Asian community too, where we also sit at this intersection where as an Asian community, relatives, aunties always talk about our bodies all the time. It's, oh, have you eaten? You look like you're withering away. Oh, you need to gain a little more muscle. This practice of just commenting on each other's bodies all the time. And I have relatives in Taiwan and it's like, when I go visit, this is the first thing that usually comes up. Just commenting about like my hair, my skin, and then my body and what I've noticed, too, is the grace that's afforded to male bodies versus female bodies in Asian communities is very different. For my sister, for my female cousins, just a lot more hypercriticism 
about the body. But at the same time, I feel that other people also, um, such as myself, I've experienced it as well. But it wasn't until I had sat down, I had a very deep conversation with my sister and my cousins, and we just talked about this and just about traumas we faced growing up. And one of it that came up time and time again was also the Asian community and the way in which we either critique or uplift and compliment our bodies when we see each other. No, it's true. So it's interesting because eight, nine years ago, I was about 50 pounds heavier than I am now. And I remember that it was always, if you want to know exactly where you stand, you always ask an Asian mother. And I had lost 50 pounds and I did it in a safe manner. It was with diet and exercise. I became a big uh, marathon runner, did everything the right way. But it was still that entire sense of ideal and your parents and other members of the, of the just the Asian community saying, oh my gosh, you're so fat and putting a lot of that. And I think those always come in, but then it, it was interesting because once I lost all my weight, they're like, oh my God, you're so skinny. You know, you see a different version of me. I'm happier with my body. I'm healthier and I'm doing things in the right way. But it was one of those times when you're, it really dawned upon me what that relationship to physicality was as an Asian man and also really understanding what does it mean to be a gay man who is fat and Asian in the community. It was very strange. I would tell you that there wasn't a lot of self-love at that point because I didn't see myself as somebody who could be loved because I was heavy. And I think as I went through that and figured that out on my own and lost my weight, I developed a much better appreciation of what does it mean to be healthy? What does it mean to love your own body? And how do you deal with those interesting intersections about what they expect physically of a gay man, physically of an Asian man, physically as a gay Asian man, the gay community, as well as in the larger community, as well as within the family. And I think it's very complex because you almost don't know where to go or what to do or how to actually react. And it goes back to, do you love yourself? Do you love what you do? How you did it? And more importantly, did you do it in a way that wasn't harmful to yourself, right? And I think that's the part that we always lose because we always focus on that product and on what we finally look like. For me now, I developed this love for running. I'm actually running a half marathon here in Miami in a few weeks. And after we talk today, I'm going to go on my 10 mile long run this afternoon. And it sounds crazy, <laughs> but I absolutely love it. I get so much done in my head when I'm running, and, you know, it's therapeutic. I go without music and it's such a big centering part for me. And people are like, are you doing to lose weights? No, I'm doing it because I love it. And, but again, going back to the intersectionality between being Asian and gay, I think we all struggle with our perceived body type and depending on, on where you are at any point in time, it could be so traumatizing that it could, again, worsen your own mental health. And I think those are the things that we have to be very realistic about, especially if you are struggling with weight, if you are struggling with your body image, I, I, I think our parents are using it as a way to point out that maybe we should find healthy ways to, to get you to a better state. But at the same time, I think there's a lot that we, we just have to recognize can be traumatic when, it, when we approach it the wrong way. What I always say is we're all on our own journey. We also don't know the other journeys that other people are on. And I think one of the hard parts is especially growing up in an Asian community and being told to respect your elders, never talk back. And when we hear a comment such as this, and sometimes very hurtful comments about ourselves and the way we can love ourselves, our bodies, and, and it's okay to not accept all the comments and all the feedback from people because people are also not perfect and on their own journeys and figuring their own stuff out. And I think we as queer Asian folks sit at this interesting intersection where it's just we, we face it from so many angles and realizing that what we're receiving is also the work that has yet to be done from the people around us and that where it really starts is just with ourselves in the space that we have and there are some practices that I've learned over the years that has really shifted. One being just being kinder to the way we speak to ourselves, using much more positive words. Granted, we can set goals, but our goals cannot be set in a self-degradating negative fashion because that only goes so far. We can't call ourselves terrible things. We can't call ourselves something that's really harsh, thinking that's going to get us from point A to point Z. It's going to get us from point A to point B, 
But what we've done is we sacrifice the long-term longevity, the ability for it to be a positive holistic practice. So that's the first one that's helped me is just framing things in a positive light. And then the second part is focusing on the little win. When we're doing the little things that push us towards the positive habits that result in ways that we want to feel more of feeling healthier, happier, focusing on the little wins and complimenting ourselves, uplifting that. And then the third part that I learned through a yogic practice was just caressing our bodies, just like feeling ourselves up and appreciating it. And this one yoga teacher that I had this beautiful practice of baths and so sitting in a bath and in the bath we are naked it's just us and we're with our bodies and using that moment to then caress and feel parts of our bodies and just being appreciative of this skin that we have this mass that is just allowing us to traverse through life and move through spaces and have this energy to do amazing things and just sitting with it and appreciating ourselves. And we often forget we have sensory perceptions right on our fingertips and we can use that to really feel ourselves. And one of my meditation practices, we also practice breathing into our hands just to know to contextualize your breath. I think it's almost the same practice of how are we contextualizing our body for ourselves. I think those three practices have really shifted the way in which I see, I talk to myself, definitely still work in progress. I could still feel superficiality creep on me, especially when I'm on social media or some of these spaces where it's just very hyper-focused on body. But just stuff like this has really not just shaped the way I see myself and talk to myself, but the way I see and talk to other people. And question for you is just, do you have any recommendations as a physician or just as a queer Asian person of ways that have either helped you or your patients to navigate some of the stuff that we talked about today. When we do something, right, whether it's physically or what have you, I always ask you, why are you doing it? Are you doing it for you? So exercise, diet, what have you, nothing should seem like a chore and nothing should be done because you're trying to impress another person or be part of the community so you can be like everybody else. It's about is it for you? Is it something that you want to do and that this is something you feel is important to you? The second part is you should always think about how am I going to do this in a way that is going to best benefit me as a person and that we're doing it in the way that's going to be as healthy as possible. As much as your friends at the gym or your friends elsewhere are trying to help you, when people start talking about medication, supplements, or what have you, it's that bro science that a lot of people talk about, but it doesn't necessarily mean that because other people are doing it, that it's going to be helpful. If you're not certain, talk to your doctor. I've had lots of patients who have tried all kinds of different things and they come and talk to me and say, is this helpful? Is this not be helpful? I was like, I don't know what any of this is. I, as a physician, I don't know what this is. And that should be really concerning if your doctor doesn't know what this is to really think about what are you putting in your body? Is it really harming you? And if you don't know, the last thing you need to do is actually do something that lands you in the hospital. A lot of times patients are worried about being judged by my physician. So the first thing I would say is well, if you feel like you're being judged by your physician, you may have the wrong physician and it's okay to change physicians when there are ways to actually find gay friendly physicians. The GLMA website, the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association website has a database of physicians who work with the community if you're not comfortable talking about this with them. But then the other part of it is your physicians are, will assess things based upon, is it really going to be good for you or not good for you? And is there a healthy way of doing it? And then the third thing, which you were leading to is you have to have self-love and that you have to love yourself, love who you are, love the skin you're in. And self-improvement is always a good thing, but self-improvement comes from self-love. It doesn't come from the necessarily that you want the love of others, but it's because you love yourself through your own journey, through my journey, we got to where we are, not because we were trying to impress the next person on Instagram through our thirst tweets or what have you, that we were doing it out of our own self-love. That's why the one challenge I hate the most right now on TikTok is a ring light challenge. That ring light challenge is just perpetuating the same thing over and over again. And yes, they're pretty, all that kind of stuff. But that one particular challenge takes out 
is everybody else who doesn't love their body. And again, going back to our thing about social media, it doesn't help and it just makes things and how we perceive ourselves worse. So go back to who you are, go back to self love and think, what am I doing? And is it really because I'm focused on my love of myself and who I am? This is what I tell my patients. And I personally work with them and trying to figure out what are ways to do, what are safe ways of doing it. But I'm always wary about using performance enhancing medications, using even the patients who use a lot of pre-workout and stuff like that. I'm like, hey, you know what? There's a reason that our bodies can't do things very quickly. There's a reason that you can't do certain things. Are you lifting those weights because you feel great and healthy and it brings you energy or the three workouts so that you can get as big as possible, as fast as possible so that you can press everybody else? Yeah. Sustainable practice, sustainability, that should be the end goal. And also with the end in mind, what do we want to be like 50, 60 years from now and starting with that and moving towards that? Versus this immediate goal that we want in five. Some people want it in one year, which is absolutely mental. And the body takes time, it takes time to adapt. It takes time to grow. And that part is beautiful. And we want our bodies to be slow and adapting because it means that change won't immediately impact our bodies. And we don't realize the opposite, which is when we work out, we're like, why aren't we gaining all these things immediately? It's because the body is slowly adapting. If on the flip side, we just kept adapting immediately to everything that happened the day before, like our bodies would have no sense of homeostasis or normalcy at all. And this slow and steady nature is actually quite beautiful and allowing us to really enjoy each and every step of the process and learning more about ourselves. And the last note that I have is everyone's on their own journey. And the last thing we can do to piggyback off your point is follow the journey that somebody else has charted for themselves, thinking that that is for us and that our journey is all about what is nourishing for us, sustainable for us, working with physicians to identify what are the right steps that we can take to live a long, healthy, thriving life. Yes. I, I tell patients all the time, my goal is not for you to survive through this. My goal is is for you to thrive and thriving means different things to different people. And we'll all work with you to make sure you're thriving in the way that works best for you. We're here for you as physicians. I think we need to do a better job of actually identifying when we're using a lot of these unhealthy um, mechanisms, but it's something that we as a community really need to take a better hard look at ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Some rapid questions at the end. 2022 resolutions for you. So my personal resolutions are one that I continue to run, that I love it. It's the way that I center myself. You have some good weeks and some bad weeks, but it's always about doing the run for the purpose of myself. The second part is to reconnect. I think COVID has made it really tough to reconnect in the way that we have in the past and we we're all waiting for 2021 to open up again and things like that. And I think 2022 has pushed me to really think about how do I want to reconnect? And I think that's one of my other big resolution. And then number three is really focused for myself and for others to focus on, on self-compassion. I think we've been hard on ourselves. It's been a rough journey for all of us. And really thinking about that this is a tough time for a lot of us. I'm in a leadership position. Many of us work with a lot of different people and it's been tough and understanding that uh, while we'd love to be able to do all these amazing things, that this is a time when we should really think about what's going to be best for ourselves and how we actually love ourselves, I think is an important part of how we're going to be successful and continue to thrive in 2022. Good points. <laughs> 2022 resolution, one of the resolution is this concept of grounding myself in community and spaces that I associate myself with, the queer community, the BIPOC community, the queer BIPOC community. And a creator and I have a challenge this year, which is to center our purchasing habits in queer and BIPOC spaces as much as possible. And Really looking at more than just gifts that we buy or trinkets for other people, but looking at services that we use for our businesses, technologies that we use, 
and looking at alternatives and trying to see all of the different ways in which we can uplift our community members around us. And it came out of this insight where we as community members, we work so hard to make money, amass all this wealth, and then we simply let white institutions take it from us. We don't really keep the wealth within our communities. And so that was one challenge that we created, which was just the, the question of how are we uplifting and pushing our community towards success as a collective. And one thing that one of my nonprofit organizations started doing was we buy gift cards for people who present with our organization and all these things. And we shifted to buying gift cards from local queer and local BIPOC businesses for people. We'll send like a thank you letter to people when they collaborate with us, but we search like the address that we're sending the card to and try to find in like a five mile radius, a queer or BIPOC business in the neighborhood. And we'll buy a gift card from them and then put that with a card and then send that off to people. And so that's been another interesting activity where we're actively seeking businesses that we want to uplift versus like an easy cop-out, which would be like an Amazon gift card that we're just sending to people. And it may take a little bit more work, but the impact that it may have pays dividends when we think about this in like the holistic sense. Interesting challenge. If anyone's interested, (laughs) uh, more than welcome to join us. (laughs) I I just love how you're thinking about not only how you're betting yourselves, but how do you actually give back um, to the to the overall community? That's amazing. And then second rapid question for you is how are you recharging yourself this year? So it was interesting. I had a, this exact conversation with my resident and I always think about not recharging, but popping off. Because if we recharge, that assumes that we are going to completely deplete ourselves. And then we're going to the recharge or fill up that bucket again. And so I think about topping off constantly. And I think about what is it what that I'm doing every day for who I am. And it's about, am I giving back to my community? Am I giving myself that 15 minutes uh, back to myself to recharge? Everybody likes to travel. Everybody likes to do, likes to read a book. And I'm really thinking about what is it that I'm doing every day to constantly top off? Because I don't want to get to the point where I feel like I have to completely recharge because then I've decided that I'm okay with traumatizing my life all, all the way till I get to empty. Love that. I, I think that's a beautiful enough. It's just, what's that extra bounty that we give ourselves that allows it to f- overflow that we can then give onto others. I think that's a beautiful analogy. And because I think many of us wait, we just wait until we're like, okay, I'm just going to sit and cry in my bathroom every night. But as long as I can get to my next vacation, I'm going to Iceland for a week, that week is going to be amazing. But every time we do that, we always find that wasn't enough. And it's like, the reasons those aren't enough to actually fill you up. You have to constantly fill it up little by little. Sustainable practices, right? It's not sustainable to keep doing this thing where we keep burning ourselves out and then trying to have one week to compensate for a whole year, maybe, of just absolutely decimating ourselves physically and mentally. Like one week off, recharge, make up for all these weeks, 51 weeks, right? But it's funny, if you think about it, if you did vacations in order to keep yourself constantly back to where you want it to be, you would spend hundreds of thousands of dollars every year just traveling because it's just not enough. Yes, yes. Then the question for you is, what are you doing every day that's allowing you to top off? So usually my top off is usually going for my three to five mile run every day or reading my book or... I'm going through the golden girls right now. It's something, it's a little something every day. And I deliberately think about what is it that I'm going to do? And, and that's what I'm going to do every day. And it's not something I necessarily say this is exactly it, but it's something. And I think that's really what we do a much better job of planning our meetings through today than we do planning how we're going to actually recenter ourselves. JT, it's been another beautiful conversation. Thank you for sharing your insights your expertise and having this really important conversation, especially in the new year. 
as we think about how we're going to chart our year to be successful, more conscious, more mindful, and more sustainable for us to thrive. And for our listeners, how can people follow your work? How can people get in touch? Thank you. So you can follow me on my Twitter at JT Dagupan, D-A-G-U-P-A-N, or you can follow me on my Instagram. My Instagram handle is John980206. And you can follow me at Stephen Wakabayashi, but on Twitter it's at Waku because my name doesn't fit within the character count. <laughs> uh, well, thank you, JT. It's always a pleasure. Thank you again, Stephen. This has been, as always, tons of fun. I really enjoyed this. Thank you. Thank you. And let's uh, follow up later this year, maybe in another conversation and see where COVID takes us. And for our listeners, I hope you are getting a little bit insight into a conversation today and to take some of the lessons so that you can have a much rich and beautiful year ahead. <laughs> and for everyone listening, thank you and hope your day can be a little bit more mindful. <laughs> Bye now.